Storytellers AZ, a discussion group for people who make a living telling stories. Hello and welcome to another episode of Storytellers AZ. Storytellers AZ is a podcast and a meetup group that meets the second and fourth Wednesday of every month at Gangplank. We're a group of storytellers, writers, ad people, podcast producers, ex-screenwriters. And a real writer. Uh, and who's the real writer? Well, that would be you. I'm an actual writer. There's a difference <laughs> oh, between actual a real writer. And actual writer. <laughs> There's a slight difference. Uh, as always, I am Tyler Hurst amid the laughter, and to my left is... Debbie Walker. Debbie, what do you do? I, I produce this podcast, among other things. She makes us sound better. She cuts out all the bad the bad things. All Which right. is usually Tyler. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and speaking of bad things, Brian, who are you and what do you do? I've been a television writer, a screenwriter, and I'm currently writing plays. Thank you very much, Tyler. Uh, Brian actually had an excellent presentation today. Uh, there was a brown bag, and apparently it was very well received. Um, there was a a site visit for a possible grant of thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Hundreds of thousands. Of hundreds of thousands of dollars from um, ASU and Laddie Core was here, and Brian apparently gave a very good presentation on um, some screenwriting stuff that he made up about his life and things like that. So and Allegedly, he used to work in Hollywood. So, but apparently, it was very good, so good job. Thank you very much. <laughs> and then I'll expect my 10% when we, uh, we get the money. Yes, uh, it's checks in the mail. And to his left is... Matt Fox. And you do? I write at persuasiontheory.com. All right. All right. Uh, today we talked about, earlier we talked about uh, Steve Jobs. And today we are talking about uh, how we address our audience when we write or when we speak or, or, or when we market to them. Uh, do you talk above them? Do you talk to them? Or do you talk below them? And each of those has their own uh, their own benefits. And I'm going to start with Brian because he's the... The TV guy. So what do you do? Of those three, which, which is the most successful? The most successful? That's a, that's a big question. Mm -hmm. um, the que you're asking, I guess, the way to look at it is what does the network want you to write? They have a specific audience for a certain time slot, which they're talking about for you. Which is just like a client. So, so whatever the target market is but but is it more effective to write above or below whatever the market is? Well, I'll give you an example. Um, worked on a show called Dinosaurs back in the '90s, which was seen as a children's show because it was star dinosaurs, stars, big dinosaur puppets with the Henson Company. Mm -hmm. okay. um, you and they would the network would have been thrilled if we just wrote stuff for little kids to see the big dinosaurs and just the baby going, "Not the mama, not the mama." Did you write "Not the mama, not the mama"? We all wrote Not the Mama. Because that the was mama. the yeah, best part of that whole that. damn show. <laughs> Everybody on the staff wrote Not the Mama way too many times than we wanted to. <laughs> they used to stand over us with whips going, we want more Not the Mama, Not the Mama. Anyway. What you talking about, Will? But as writers, they hired a staff of writers who were adults who didn't want to write children's show. We weren't writing Saturday morning TV. No, you're writing Friday night right. TV. Yeah. No, we weren't. We were writing Wednesday. Was it Wednesday? Wednesday. Stand it was Wonder Wednesday Years, Wednesday. Dinosaurs. Wonder Years Dinosaurs, Doogie Howser is the way it went on ABC. So we were writing, and it was at the same time as The Simpsons was coming out. So we wanted to write more intelligent mm -hmm. stories that kids are still going to get the little baby stuff, mm -hmm. and we're going to write above them. Mm -hmm. And what we ended up doing is we ended up getting a large, larger share than expected of adults. So we wrote, a, we wrote as a staff, we chose to write above the audience that they expected us to get. Okay, and what does that mean, above the audience? Well, when you're writing a kid's show, you're, you're okay. writing for, you know, 6 to 14-year-olds. Simple themes. Simple things. Simple no, nothing controversial. Okay. Um, just basic storylines. When I looked at that as far as writing above the audience, you're bringing, like, politics into it. You're bringing um, organized corporate law into it. You're okay. bringing in um, religion into it. You're bringing up subjects that they're not – they don't put on kid shows, okay. you know. Subjects that South Park does every week. Abstract concepts that may not be familiar to people who don't seriously understand America or the language or stuff like that. Absolutely. Okay. And like I said, it, it, you know, people, you, when we first hit the air, people go, oh, my kids love that show. And we said, we'd always say, like, you know, well, why don't you watch it sometime too? And by the time it was off the air, it was the adults going, I love that show. My kids would watch it with me, but I love the show. So that was an example of writing above the audience we were given 
and it was a success. Yeah. I was going to say, I think that also because of the time slot that it was in between two major show. I mean, Doogie Howser, you said it was between Doogie Howser and uh, The Wonder Years, right. yeah, which were both down. had wide mainstream audience also. Right. So if you were just writing to kids, you probably would have lost a lot. Well, or at least the, 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 the we, we all thought so, but the network wanted us to write the, more, not the mama. Interesting. Um, they wanted every week it was more baby. Can we get more baby in the show? More now, baby. Now, is it possible to, to use either adult themes, and I don't mean porn, but adult themes with simpler language? Is that more effective or is it, is it, is it better to use, you know, advanced language and simpler themes? No, I think it's adult themes. And, okay. And it's, it's all with adult themes. And yeah, okay. absolutely. We did an episode that was about um, Robbie not wanting to eat meat. Okay. He didn't want to be a meat eater anymore. Yep. And it was a very clear uh, metaphor for everyone who worked on the show and most people who watched it. He was gay. He, would, he, was, con- he was considering being gay. Okay. He would hang out in gay. In wait, wait. He was considering being gay? He's being gay. gay. So gay is, gay is a choice? Just in, at that point. In, okay. in that episode. Um, he would hang out in what hey, would be considered gay. <laughs> <laughs> the address is. <laughs> um, he would hang out in gay bars and hang out with. A, he was questioning his sexuality. Got it. Well, that's what it looked like. Yeah. However, the network believed it was all about actually vegetarianism, which it was. It was on one level, mm-hmm. but the other level was you know because Earl was upset that his son was going to become a vego, Come. <laughs> which is the word we use. It was called Vejo, Vejo. So it was clearly, no one calls a vegetarian a Vejo. Wow. It was a gay allegory. That's good. Right? Right, that's, um, good. that's good. And, but the kids think vegetarian. The network thought vegetarian. And we won an award for vegetarianism that year. Nice. And, um, you know, when the award came out, and I just said, can we tell them what the show's about? They said, no, 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 we'll take the award. <laughs> so that's actually pretty cool. I mean, that, that, that makes sense as far as adult themes and, and simpler language. Yeah, but if the only people who got it were the writers? Did you really? We're not the only ones who got it. Oh, most adults got. It. I'm just saying, the people that had the focus on the kids stuff, the network and the um, and the people, the vegetarian society. <laughs> it's like they're looking, you know, they're looking for any show that mentions vegetarianism. And they give them a word, mm, that kind of a thing. Okay. So yeah, most people got it. You guys got to hear just me saying mm-hmm. vegjo. Debbie. Yeah. Yeah. Your personal blog, I would say it's adult themed. Yes. Do you find it's easier to talk directly to your audience? Yes. Below them or above them? Um, I usually talk directly to them. Yeah. This is, you're more, much more of a first person. Yeah. Using I a lot. Yeah. It's my personal journal yeah. more than anything. Okay. But, uh, yeah, I, in my journal, in my blog, I write to people. Okay. Like I'm talking to them. Okay. Sales-wise. Matt? I mean, obviously, not one thing works, but is there? There has to be some sort of formula that's somewhat repeatable. Well, when it comes to you know, from a blog perspective, you want to write obviously to your market or, or whoever it is you're trying to appeal. Same thing with the sales letter, um, and that's how I always think about it. Just like what you said, you're writing to your market, and you can't use words larger than what they're used to. Um, as we were talking about earlier, you've got to be writing towards the People magazine, the... the ESPN.com. Uh, the ESPN.coms, as you pointed out. <laughs> you know, True. the gossip journals, the... Uh, uh, oh, what the heck's There's the a difference between how you would write for the Bud Light guys as opposed to the craft beer people. Oh, Correct. Good one. Correct. Correct. Because they all have their nuances and things that they know, but you don't want to use words that are... Larger when you don't have to. Um, that, that's a pretty good rule <laughs> altogether, though, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, I read... I, I was funny. The other day, I, we were driving, and, and there was one of those bumper stickers that says, Eschew... Uh, up, 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 Eschew <laughs> obfuscation, yeah. <laughs> Eschew obfuscation. Shit. I just love not Eschew being able to say it. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but I joked. I looked at my wife. I go, you know... That the people that buy that bumper sticker, you know, they have to go look up the words in the dictionary to, to go. Oh my god, that's so funny! We've got to put that in our car. There's no one who actually uses those words. Yeah, in our car oh. or teachers. That's possible. That's <laughs> yeah, but, but that, I mean, and but you, yeah, you're you're not going to be using large, or not commonly heard words. Okay. But you want to use things that are bring about uh, um, 
the the senses and 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 relate to them that they can relate to. Yeah, I mean, I've noticed very similar things. I mean, when I first started writing, uh, especially online blogging, um, I mean, it's, I would I'd call it serious blogging. It was marketing blogging, business blogging. Is I try to do you know high minded, uh, a big world, you know, big big picture type stuff, and no one no one got it. I mean, I was try I was basically trying to show off how smart I was, and um, it j- it didn't it never it never connected. Not even once. Not even to me. And you could tell that I was forcing it out there because it felt like I was writing a paper rather than just writing. Yeah, and that's it. It's not about proper grammar. Mm-hmm. It's not about um, well, pro- well, proper grammar and spelling. Well, well spelling, part. yes. I, I, I agree with spelling. Yeah. Grammar, to a certain extent, there are certain rules to make things yes. more clear yes. and, and come across more, like more punctuation, easily. punctuation. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and using punctuation uh, f- as it's intended. But you want to write like you're speaking, so like you, you're talking you to somebody. You shouldn't have a whole paragraph full of ellipses? Hmm. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Debbie has, has a thing about that. Yeah, she, she loves them. Yeah. Loves so let me ask you, Tony, because when you're talking about writing about to that audience, mm-hmm. is that uh, is that other uh, audience that may be smarter, more intelligent, more hip? Mm-hmm. Are they are they on that website? You see, in television, there's such a huge audience, potential audience. Yeah, no, I'm it's, not. You know, it's the whole country. So I'm writing to to myself and people like me. Um, uh, but and 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 that was. And that's just a business thing of, of of me learning about what connected with people, but it also made more sense for me too because I became better um, as I as I made that switch. Because my because my biggest thing was I was I'm a trained journalist, third person, um, you know, explain everything, over explain everything if you have to, um, just use the least amount of words possible. And I thought that writing in first person was somehow inferior, and that was just something that's that's been gra- that's ingrained in my head because using I a lot it well it obviously it gets annoying when you when you say I all the time but that's mm-hmm. just but that and so I equated first person with saying I uh, and once I kind of go, got over that stopped using I as much I found out you could actually write in first person without sounding like a jackass and when or, when you use I you're putting in opinion you're putting in <laughs> you know actual emotions because mm-hmm. in journalism there are no emotions yeah. but I've also found that that when I'm um, dealing with in like in everyday communication with with business communication as far as memos or marketing documents or or emails and things like that is I tend to write very much below my audience because I know a lot of people especially in the corporate world use very specific you know they, they, they use um, shorthand or, or weird weird terms they say super appreciative instead of just appreciative or things like that because they overdo it because they want to make sure that they are understood and so i do or as i heard an example i read an example earlier completely severed yeah there you go like like there's like a partially (laughs) severed option Uh, you know there's a there's a website called unnecessary journalism phrases that does exactly exactly that in most of my business communication i write and what i consider and sorry to everyone who's read my stuff to dumbasses because you that's how people you should communicate with me on that. That's most of the biz, biz communication I see because it's written the lowest common denominator, um, and I, I, I somewhat emulate that. And that's a tough thing for me to. I would say from do. my experience with people in those types of situations, I'm trying to think of a nice way to say it, but they all have something inside where they have to portray that image that they are smarter than they are. I can think of a person that I used to work with that that was just the way she was she was going for her phd her mm-hmm. doctorate or whatever whatever what she was going for in business and and used these words and i'm just i'm going that's okay, cool you're, yeah. you're dressed like a dingbat yeah. and you're using these words trying to sound intelligent but it just doesn't jive with yeah. with with the, with the behavior yeah and so and, and 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 we talked about this earlier as long as someone uses uh, speaks in a manner and uses words in a manner that match what my perception mm-hmm. of them or my my knowledge of them so if i see some you know uh person i know that's dumb and uses big words and i'm then i'm not going to believe them at all but if i see someone who is who is you know decently well spoken and uses and uses those then, then i'm okay with it but a lot of times people use um use the use the big words and talk down to make themselves just feel better and always fails mm-hmm. right but this is i think we're a little bit off track as far as writing what level for the audience because one thing i've noticed over the last 20 years is when a television show or a movie is labeled smart so it's the smartest show on television. They it still use that. It does poorly. It does not it? poorly. It doesn't it does do poorly? Not to, no, Seinfeld was considered the smartest show on television. Seinfeld's not very smart. I'm telling you, but it was that's how it was marketed. It mm-hmm. was New York elite, smart, smarmy, whatever you want to call it. But it was a smart show. Larry David's show 
is very well, popular on well, HBO. I, I think that might have been a positioning type thing. The same thing with Larry David because it, it's a certain niche that gets it. And well, just it is right. You're, it is a niche, but what I'm saying is, why not shoot for that niche? Now I understand if you're if you're hired to work for Coca Cola, you're going to write stuff for Coca Cola mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. But when you write that, outside that's, that's, outside of the blogging world, outside of the advertising world, where you're looking at their audience. When you're writing in a more creative way, I think we should all be writing above. Well, the example, like a Seinfeld, I mean, it, it was a great show. Don't get me wrong. I enjoyed it very much. It's like the craft beer example. There's, I, I'm not a beer drinker. I mean, I, I drink it. I don't, as long as it's really, really almost frozen cold, I can drink it. I like it. Um, so but you can't from really a, taste it, basically. Yeah, it's from a craft beer perspective. Really like I could really care less if it's yeah. a craft beer or not. If you give me gin. That's a different thing. And that's the way Seinfeld was. It positioned itself instead of just being another comedy, which it wasn't. It's a comedy for smart people. Right. Okay, well, obviously nobody wants to be considered stupid. Right, exactly. <laughs> so they're gonna so watch, you have to watch, watch it, it and get it. Yeah, exactly. If you don't get it, you have to pretend that and you do correct. it. Correct, and that's the same thing with craft beer or cigar smoking or you know any of these things that are kind of you want to position yourself in a way as being different from somebody else or But that's superior. a good thing, having people yeah. strive to be better than they are instead of Oh, playing yeah. Alice well, every right. week. Debbie, uh, Frasier was a smart show. Seinfeld was labeled as a smart show. Right. Are they both smart shows? Because they're, they're very different. Very, very different. But what was the difference between them? They, they, I mean, they both had a central character, a sidekick, dealt with adult themes. Well, they're all, yeah, they're all and they, shows and they the were both show. labeled as, as smart shows, but they're obviously not the same. Well, no. well 30 Rocks considered a smart show. There you go. It's different in comedy. Okay. And then it was different at that time frame. And it, when Seinfeld was out, what else was there? Nothing. There was Friends. Cosby's. Cosby's. Frasier. Cosby's or Frasier. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So, you know, as compared to what? As compared to, I don't know, the Jiggle of the Week thing? Or, yeah. you know, the there wasn't the same amount of, 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 of what Debbie calls ice cream um, right. on there. There wasn't much ice cream TV. We, we had just started the talk shows. Mari Povich and all that started to become popular, but we didn't have yeah. the... Yeah, your, your nighttime shows. So I think yeah. now, in the last couple of years, you're starting to see more thought put into some of the stuff in not in mainstream television so much as uh, like HBO and Showtime. Yeah, those are great. FX and um, Sci-Fi Channel. I mean, I loved yeah. BSG. To me, that was a smart show. Yeah. And I know I don't get Showtime and also, but I know that a lot of those shows they're really starting to develop for a higher thinking audience it's not just ice cream it's you know yeah. it you think really that's makes a good you thing? think yeah i think it is yeah i think uh, and that's what people have been up to that point that's what people were asking for it's like you know tv's a cesspool of garbage and nothing and there's huh. 800 channels and nothing on well that was true but i don't think it is so much anymore i think you know you can find things now that are semi-intelligent and make you think and Use both halves of your brain. Mm-hmm. Okay. I guess th- there's a niche for everything. There's the Jersey, so- the Jersey Shore niche. There's your Jerry Springer Seinfeld. slash Jersey yeah, Shore Jersey. slash. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you have the ano- and you have the anomaly that is <clears throat> on the Fox Channel. You have a sh- an intelligent show like House from mm-hmm. the same people that bring you the news. I don't like House, but I I understand where people think that that's an intelligent show. My biggest thing with shows is, especially, is is dialogue. If the dialogue doesn't sound natural and 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 smart, then I, I I'll run away. Uh, one of my favorite shows, Castle, uh, I would think is a is a fairly fairly smart show. I'm not extremely smart, but they have a new character on this season. Um, the the female police commissioner chief person, and her only job is apparently to sound like an idiot. Yeah. Because all she does is ask. <laughs> uh, it, it it feels like one of the producers of the network or somebody said, hey. Some of our audience doesn't get it, so you need to explain it for them. And they put in a character whose job was to ask obvious questions, and just to prove to lead that the story along. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. horrible. Yeah, it sounds like a network note. There's a famous it's book about sounds. Hollywood television, about famous network notes, and if you can find it, I suggest you go out and get it. It's called "A Martian Wouldn't Say That," which was a network note given to the, the writers of My Favorite Martian. Uh, yeah. Uh, but but that that brings up a, a good comparison because Psych also is, is one of my favorite shows, and I would not consider that a very smart show because it's very slapstick, it's very it's very funny and kind of stupid comedy. But I've come to expect that very much, and I understand that that's what that is going to give me. That's why it's such a, sh- a shock to see 
um, a, a character like that in Castle, which was fine. She seems out of character for the yes. show. Yes, very much so. Very much so. All right, uh, that is all we have for tonight. Thank you again for showing up. Again, Storytellers AZ, we're a podcast and a meetup group. We meet the second and fourth Wednesday of every month. You can find us online at storytellersaz.com. If you'd like to email me and say things, say bad things about Brian or Matt or <laughs> praise me or Debbie, that's cool. Tyler at gangplankhq.com. Thanks, and we'll see you later. Thank you for listening to Storytellers AZ. We'll see you next time. Manamana. 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 Manamana.